Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the second day of our Java webinar week. My name is Bartosz Cetrowski, and I'll be your host for today. This event is brought to you by Spartes with a huge help from the awesome team of Just Join IT. Yesterday, we talked about microservices. Today, we focus on performance. The upcoming talk will be performed by Paweł Gruszczyński, who is a Java dev with almost 20 years of experience. He graduated from Poznan University of Technology and worked for big companies like Google, Roche, and now he works at Spartus, where he also kicks asses while playing table football. Before I pass the mic to Paweł, a small reminder, we have a focus challenge for you all with prizes to win. Watch out for unexpected slides in his presentation. Paweł, the stage is yours. Good luck. Okay, welcome everybody. It's time to tell you performance improvement story. Uh, so my name is Paweł Gruszczyński. I'm a passionate Java developer, mostly focused on the backend with almost 20 years of experience. And I've been with Spartus for two years already. Uh, in this presentation, I will briefly talk about performance. First, I will mention some reasons of performance issues, uh, then how to identify them, and finally, how to fix them. After that, we will go through real-life example of performance improvement, and the presentation will last for about, I would say, 20, 25 minutes. Uh, after that, we will have a Q&A session. OK, so let's start. Um, let's first talk about the reasons of performance issues. I'm not going to talk about all possible reasons, just some of them, the ones that I've been, uh, I've seen the most often in my experience. Uh, well, first obvious thing is like poor code. Uh, for example, using bubble sort instead of more performant algorithm might be fine for small set of the data, but will become problematic for, for larger data sets. Uh, using some libraries and tools might be quite tricky. If you don't get things right, uh, it may lead to se severe performance issues. Uh, another category is bad design. Um, for example, if modules are incorrectly designed, it may lead to uh, communication overhead. Uh, if the APIs do not provide bulk support, it might be impossible to write inefficient code on top of them. Um, inefficient database access is another thing. Uh, for example, X SQL query, might be inefficient because it's too complex, or maybe there are some indexes missing. Uh, N plus one is a typical database access problem. Uh, there is a mismatch between relational and object-oriented world. And then because of that, there is a actually high chance of running into this kind of a problem. Uh, so let's say you want to fetch people and their properties from the database. First, you select people matching some criteria. And then for each person, you fetch their properties separately. Uh, as a result, you end up with uh, n plus one queries when n is the number of uh, people selected, selected in the first query. Uh, not great, but unfortunately, it happens quite often. Um, another cate category I called abstraction. So tools and libraries are simplifying things for the programmer, uh, but also as a result, might hide something and it might be hard or maybe even impossible to tune and get everything right. Uh, another example is aggregating across multiple data sources. I will explain it on a picture on the next slide. So let's say that we have four data sources, like A, B, C, and D. All of these sources provide Java interface with getData method. And we need to aggregate uh, data across those data sources. Uh, so we simply call get data on all of them. Um, as you can see, as a result, we call uh, like we select the data from the same database table three times, even though technically we could fetch the data in a single call. Um, another thing is that with our uh, with time, our customers grow, and you know they have more users, more entries in the database, more data in memory. The data gets more complex with time. More users also mean more traffic on average, higher spikes, et cetera. And this, this causes, if we don't improve our software, this causes performance degradation with time. Uh, last category of problems that I would like to mention is setup. Uh, this is both hardware and setup, like CPU, memory, bandwidth, connections, et cetera, but also configuration, uh, like in wrong load balancer configuration. 
may cause serious performance issues. And if your application is database heavy, misconfiguring database pool or using incorrect one uh, will have dramatic impact. Uh, okay, so we briefly talked about reasons. Let's now discuss how we can identify performance issues. Um, so there are significant differences uh, between cloud and self-hosted world. Like in cloud, uh, we control the machine on which our software is running, so we are, we are in a better position. There is much more we can do. In case of self-hosted, software is installed and managed by customers, and our possibilities are unfortunately limited. Um, so in, ca in case of cloud, uh, we can install, for example, Profiler on the running code. And thanks to this, we will quickly learn about problems that customers are actually experiencing. Uh, in case of server, there will be more guessing. Uh, measuring stuff is also much easier. And, like If you want to add new analytics, we simply add them in the code. And then in the matter of hours, uh, they are live. Uh, evaluating performance uh, is also much more accurate in cloud. We can enable improvements, for example, for 10% of uh, people uh, and compare performance versus the rest so we can easily tell whether the improvement works. Give me a second. The sun is going down. <laughs> OK, let's continue. Mm. In case of self-hosted software, we have to rely more, more on the customer's feedback like bug and incident reports. And that is already bad because it means that customers are already experiencing the problem and to, it will take some time to first fix the problem, then to release new version of the software with the fix. And then the customer will have to install this, this, this version. Um, our software is also sending analytics. Uh, so at least we have some automated feedback. And if you would like to measure our performance improvement impact, that might be problematic if we don't have any existing analytics that we could compare to. Um, profiling sessions are still useful, but they are much harder than in cloud because we need to prepare like a reasonable data set or uh, simulate customer's traffic. Um, of course, there are more things we can do in both cases, uh, like code inspections can reveal performance issues. However, like this approach might be hard if you don't know where to start. It's more, much more efficient to start with the profiler and then inspect only the slowest par parts of the code. Uh, another thing we do are performance tests on uh, CI uh, to prevent performance issues and regressions. Um, they are a bit problematic, though, because they are flaky and, again, require reasonable data and traffic setup. OK, so we know what problems we have. Let's now see how we can fix them. Uh, well, obvious thing is to use uh, like more efficient algorithms and tune our libraries. Uh, some people say that performance is a feature. So it should be included in your design. For example, you should include bulk methods in the API to allow implementing performance code on, on top of your API. Um, another, another way to fix things is caching, introducing caching. As someone said, there are only two hard things in computer science, uh, like caching, validation, and naming things. Uh, however, caching is hard in case of clustering. There are some questions that we need to answer, like how to efficiently synchronize caches over nodes, how to handle transactions, how to handle consistency, etc. And uh, quite often we can implement like a lightweight version of caching, like for example in the context of a single tax task or HTTP request. Uh, so we can at least avoid fetching and computing the same uh, data multiple times. Um, you may also consider redesigning your software to improve performance. However, this is usually hard, costly, and risky. And so it's usually done only if nothing else works. Uh, 
examples I'm, I mentioned here are like redesigning your database schema. Uh, for example, the normalization. This is relatively easy, let's say. Uh, by, the, by the normalization, I mean like keeping redundant data for the sake of performance, like combining data from multiple uh, tables into one. Um, another thing you can consider is redesigning the architecture to limit, for example, communication overhead between modules. But this is usually much harder and costly to do. Um, OK, here is the secret word for today. It's nested. Please remember it. Uh, if you didn't register for webinars, do it at spartes.com Java Webinar Week. And you will get an email, and you will know what to do with this. So take a look. OK. OK, so let's finally talk about the example of performance improvement. Uh, this is only a small part of the bigger improvement, but the improvement is significant, and the change is short enough for this presentation. Uh, I'm working on Crowd, which is a product that is managing and synchronizing users across Atlassian, Atlassian applications. And let's imagine that we have a directory like LDAP or Active Directory of users. Here is the example structure. Um, the blue ones are groups, and these are users. Uh, the arrow means that there is a membership. And maybe let's take a closer look. Like admin is a member of Jira admins, like a direct member. And since the Jira admins is also a member of Jira users, and Jira users is a member of Atlassian users, Admin user is also like indirect indirect member of Jira users and Atlassian users. Um, this this membership structure is, for example, used for permission checks. Like only members of let's say Jira users can log in are allowed to log into Jira. Uh, so this structure is actually a forest because uh, like each node can have multiple children and multiple parents. Uh, this data is copied from remote directory like LDAP, Active Directory, etc., to relational database, and then it's queried from the relational database. And the data might be quite complex. Like there are customers having millions of users, hundreds of thousands of groups, and even sometimes more than 10 uh, levels of nesting groups. Um, so we would like to uh like issue following queries these are just example queries against this structure and for example like we would like to ask whether user or group is a nested member of of some other group this is involved quite often on logins on permission checks etc uh, from time to time you also want to know who are the effective like nested members of 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 given group this is involved rarely, but it's usually much cost more costly. Um, okay, how did we find out about this this problem? So, uh, well, some of our customers were reporting that things get slow if the group hierarchy is complex. Um, what we did is like we uh, we just ran the profiler and found the problematic parts of the code, and then inspected the code to find the, the uh, root cause. Um, so what reasons we found? Of, like, what reasons of slowness? Well, first thing uh, is that the code might have been performed like 10 years ago. Our customers were smaller, and they had far less groups, uh, far less nesting, and everything worked OK. Um, the other thing was that the API was missing bulk methods. And as usual, there was some cool code involved. Mm, so what solutions did we consider to, to improve the performance of, of nested groups? Uh, one, one thing is uh, like there is an SQL standard for querying hierarchical data. Uh, however, I'm not sure if it's implemented by all databases, and we need to support multiple databases uh, in the self-hosted world. 
And besides, City isn't super performant, to be honest. Uh, we also thought about getting rid of nested groups because they are causing a lot of troubles in multiple places. But of course, this is not acceptable for our customers, especially the big ones, uh, the, the enterprise customers. All right. Um, another thing we considered was like flattening the structure. Uh, so keeping effective membership in the database. Here is, here is the example how the flattening would look like. Uh, so basically, every user uh, would belong to any group that he or she belonged directly and indirectly, right? So admin belongs to Jira admin directly and Jira users and Atlas and users indirectly. And like in this flattened word on the right side of the slide, like uh, admin belongs directly to all these three groups. Uh, but if there are, let's say, 10 million of users and each of them effectively belongs to 1,000 groups, that means like billion of memberships, like of these hours that we would need to keep in the database. And this is, this is way too much. Um, besides maintaining this structure, flattened structure on the right side, it's not that easy uh, on updates, like keeping it consistent. Um, we have also considered caching, um, but I, as, as I mentioned before, we have to remember about clustering. Uh, we have to remember about transactions, cluster-wide, well, cluster and consistency of the cache. Uh, so at the beginning, we decided to implement solution without caching, and then maybe reconsider introducing caching if, if needed. Um, okay, so let's finally look at the code. Mm. So here is a code snippet. Uh, it's not a real one. It's almost similar to the real code. Um, like whether the group is a child uh, nested member of another group. Uh, so uh, this is the old implementation. How it works, more or less, uh, we keep the we keep the list of groups to visit. We start with the parent node, and then we like append children. Uh, as you can see, we iterate over the groups like one by one. That is, we just fetch one group at a time, and then uh, for each group, we actually issue two SQL queries. One is is direct member. That is also causing a SQL query, and then get direct children of group, which is also issuing another SQL query. Um, so there are two times number of groups SQL queries. That is not great. What can we do about it? Uh, so here is the implementation, the skeleton of the change that we implemented. As you can see, we introduced bulk method get direct children of groups. Um, we got rid of this is direct member call, and we basically iterate level by level, uh, not group by group. Um, and one thing I forgot to mention is like we have this uh, unique set to avoid checking the same group multiple times, and also to avoid. Uh, infinite loop in case of groups are nested in each other. Uh, so yeah, here is the comparison between the old code and new code. Um, not only the new code is much more performant, but it's actually shorter a bit. Um, OK, so this fix decreased the number of SQL queries from two times number of groups to the number of levels of groups. Uh, depending on the shape of the data, this fix improved performance like about 10 to 100 times. And we basically decided we don't need caching uh, for now. Uh, there is a pitfall here. Let's say that for some user source, user source, you would implement the new bulk method by calling the old method like this. And uh, not only it will be as slow as before, but it might be even slower because we won't break early in the middle of the batch. So let's look at the old code. We are breaking here, and 
like with the new code, there is no like break in the middle of the batch. So not only will be effectively going one by one, but also unable to break in the middle. Again, this was on the small part of bigger improvements. Uh, not everything is that relatively easy to fix and doesn't always bring uh, such significant improvements. Um, so let's let's now go to the conclusions. Let's sum it up. Uh, I recommend treating performance as a feature. Include in, include it in the design from the very beginning. Don't start with the code inspection. Uh, it's much more easier to find performance uh, issues with with, with uh, profiler. And then, once you know where to look, start uh, code inspection. Um, look for low-hanging fruits. Quite often, there are simple fixes, like the one I've shown, that improve performance significantly. And they are you know, relatively easy to implement. Um, measure your performance, like make sure you know how performant uh, your application is, and also make sure that uh, performance regression will be noticed. Mm. Another thing to, is to make sure that you understand how libraries you are using work, right? Tune them if necessary. Sometimes you might need to stop using them in particular pieces parts of the code, and sometimes you might end up like dropping them completely, right? Uh, I don't want to say not to use caching. Uh, there are plenty of scenarios that where caching makes perfect sense. However, it's not that easy to keep the cache 100% consistent in the context of clustering and tra transactions, right? And what about performance of cache replication is another question. Uh, besides, if you rely on the on the caching too much, that may lead to very bad habits, like introducing inefficient code because you know, everything is cached, so you don't care. And well, one day you might need to give up caching and for whatever reason, and you'll end up with a super slow, inefficient code. Um, OK, that's basically it from me. It's now time for questions. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was awesome. Uh, I have some questions uh, for the start. Uh, first of all, I wanted to ask how much uh, you and your team work on uh, the performance improvements. Um, it, it depends. Uh, I would say that for now we must we spent like I don't know ten percent of the time. On, on, on performance. However, I personally spend more because we have 20% uh, uh, like projects. Everyone can do their stuff in 20, like, um, you know, this concept of 20% projects, I guess. So yeah, um, yeah. Like half, half of this, uh, half of this 20% projects, I actually, I think I spent on performance. And yeah, for, for the next year, we actually plan to invest more in performance, like, one third maybe of of, of uh, our time, something like this. Okay. Um, how do you know if uh, the performance optimization that you are you are doing in your codes uh, is not premature? Premature. You mentioned some kind of measurements, but uh, do you right now in this moment of your career do you feel it by heart, or is it uh, always a matter of measures? I mean, there are some obvious things. So, like, if I can easily do something that is clearly more performant, then I will do it. If it complicates things too much, then I will probably not do it. Uh, but um, I would say that, you know, besides the obvious things, it's not that easy to tell how much given change or improvement will will give us right so I, I recommend like running profiler it will tell you the true story okay uh, what's the good enough performance like how do you measure it how, how do you know that uh, you reach the limit that you actually want to achieve are there any hints about that or uh, good question um, 
so um, good enough. Uh, rule of thumb I, I use is uh, like from my experience, quite often the slowness comes from uh, database access or some IO operations in, in general. So like optimi optimizing this part is usually bringing uh, like enough improvements. So I focus first on making sure that, you know, um, we avoid all these kind of problems like N plus one problems and we don't fetch the same data twice from the database and we fetch uh, the data in bulks, not like one by one, etc. Uh, and usually like uh, once you do this optimally, then then your performance should be fine. If not, then it gets harder. Like you have to maybe think about redesigning stuff or, um, you know, tuning database queries, which is sometimes nasty. Yeah, I get it. Uh, uh, Lukas uh, Zimla, if I get it right, is asking about the tools. Like uh, if it comes to profiling, what the tools do you recommend? I don't want to, like, I can say what we use right now. We use uh, JProfiler, uh, but I use different tools in the past. And I would say the biggest difference is to use the tool versus not using. And I'm not an expert, so I'm not going to tell you like, what's the difference between the particular uh, profilers. OK. Uh, there is one question from Matt about uh, migration to the newest JDKs, like in case of performance problems, do you migrate or is it, is it a fix or not? Um, yeah, well, <laughs> um, from my experience, like I, I don't remember um, recently uh, that this was the main issue. Right? The, the, the issues are usually in, in your software, of course, it can help. But um, for some other reasons, uh, like currently we, for example, use Java 8, and we cannot for now migrate to Java 11. So um, quite often, these this upgrades are constrained by, by other factors. Okay, so so it's not it's not always a, a solution. If someone is not constrained by other factors, it may improve the life a bit. I think so, but again, it's usually not uh, like a, it's, it's linear improvement at best, right? You can get software faster by I don't know, ten percent, twenty percent, maybe. Okay, um, I'm just guessing, but usually your problems are like uh, because of you know n plus one stuff or something like this. So you can get much more there. OK, uh, there is one question from a guy uh, or lady uh, named one, two, three, four, five, Alcatraz. Are you, perf are you perform automatic heavy performance tests daily or once a week in Spartus? Uh It depends. Uh, so I, I, I don't know about other teams. I know that they have uh, automated performance tests. In case of our team, uh, the crowd team, uh, like we have, uh, we have daily builds uh, that run performance tests. I'm not gonna lie to you; we don't have like perfect coverage, etc. <laughs> but yeah, we we run them daily. Okay, another question about uh, tooling uh, from Withel. Uh, so we have profilers, but there are also monitoring tools for, let's say, monitoring microservices in clusters. Uh, do you know any free tools that might help with that, or all of them are commercial, commercial ones? So I'm, I'm, I'm in part as working on self-hosted software. So unfortunately, like we cannot. Well, it's much more harder to use this kind of tools. So, uh, so no, I, I. I I can't help you with that, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's also harder for us without these tools, you know. 
Yeah, we may park this question for Alec, who will have presentation on Friday, if I remember correctly. He will talk. Uh, he is like a cloud engineer in in our uh, company, so we may get some answers from him. Um, okay, uh, there is one question from Łukasz Wełnicki. Uh, instead of denormalization, would you consider introducing some arbitrary mat? materialized view specific for particular access patterns. This is actually one way of implementing SecURS, but should it be considered as a remedy for poor performance? Hard question, yeah. Uh, to be honest, I usually avoid it, this kind of approach, uh, but I'm not saying it's never, it should be always avoided. Uh, but like materializing is actually very similar similar to the normalization. Um, uh, I'm saying that the materializing is like very similar to the normalization, right? It's just keeping the original uh, normalized data plus the, the normalized, right? And as far as I remember, maybe with some minor exceptions, uh, we I didn't have to do that. Oh, okay. Oh, I see Marcin Kwiatkowski. He was asking a lot of questions yesterday. Uh, today he has a comment, like premature optimization can sometimes be a waste of time. It's easy to optimize a different problem. Do you relate to that? Uh, yeah, I, I mostly agree. Um, although, as I said, like if, if I have a choice, like of doing things like clearly n times faster, then I will do it, right? But um, you might be wrong about about your assumptions, right? Uh, so in in your tests that that, that you prepare, it might look like uh, this premature optimization actually works and improves the performance, but uh, in the real world. Uh, with a different data set, different environment, different setup, it, it might be actually degrading performance. So yeah, it's it's usually not worth to do it like if you are not hundred percent sure that it's 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 better. Okay. Uh, I have, there is one question from Hubert Piesniak uh, about the code snippets that you presented. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, why so many final keywords in code snippets? Is nested member something like that? They effectively, they effective, they are effectively final anyway. Shouldn't that be enough for JIT, uh, or is it just to make uh, Sonar happy? Um, that's a good question. Um, so I actually recently switched. I I, I was skipping the final words uh, before. In the latest project, actually, we I, I met people who did the opposite. So now I'm like putting the final word ever. But I treat it mostly for like readability. So I know that it's if it's final, then you know it's not modified. Okay, I have to believe I I don't write Java on a daily basis uh, since I'm a front end developer. Um, I have a question regarding um, customers. Like, do you have experience with like negotiating features with customers by saying that we will reach some kind of limits of performance budgets? Uh, how do you uh, understand the performance budgets and how customers actually understand this stuff? Um, good question. So. The thing is that, uh, like in case of Spartas, for example, I joined the the, the project that is uh, already there for I don't know ten or more years. So you can imagine there is already a established uh, number of customers. Um, so I didn't participate in this this kind of discussions with them. Um, the thing that we are trying to achieve right now is to make sure that because they are growing and we know it like every year the number of of users and groups and nesting levels grow so we just want to make sure that uh, we will be able to 
scale with the growth. So that's that's our current approach. Okay. Uh, like how do you optimize work on performance work versus work on features? Like right now you uh, you are talking about the project that is kind of cr crystallized, yeah. It's it's stable, it's uh, in kind of some kind of some kind of um maintenance mode. Can we say that or or is it too much about it? Sorry, are you saying that crowd is in maintenance mode or yeah, is it is it in maintenance mode or are no, we no, actively no, we're still, we're still developing features, new features? Okay, okay. Um, so uh, we are talking about big projects. Uh, I believe that there are people listening to us right now that uh, doesn't that don't work on that project of that scale. Uh, do you remember something from the beginning of your career regarding the the performance that maybe will be a hint for someone who want to be performance advocate in his company? I'm not sure what kind of thing are you expecting from me. <laughs> I, I, I'm, just, I'm just curious, like, uh, you, right now you're a, a kind of expert of uh, performance in, in the company. Yeah? Uh, do you remember your uh, path to, to that level of uh, knowledge about this? How it started that you actually focused on performance? Um, Hard to tell. Like I'm, I'm, I'm mostly fo focused on backend stuff. Um, so I, during studies, also liked like um, you know competitive programming and stuff like this. So like fast algorithms. Um, uh, so I guess that that's that's one thing that maybe moved me in this direction. Uh, another thing is that like I I I like optimizing things like if i see some code that is unreadable and slow it's hard for me to you know resist and not fix it <laughs> uh, but yeah I'm, I'm not sure what kind of what else i can i can okay say, like, i, I, I get what, get what i'll say yeah uh yeah, I'm, I'm wondering from the perspective of someone who is working on the front end side, is it like every uh, person working on a back end code uh, has a focus on performance? Is it some kind of part of the definition of done of features that you are delivering or only part of them? Like... Um, I think it should be, but it not always is, I would say. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, so. Like most of the time, we don't we don't uh, start uh, like with the performance in mind. Actually, most of the problems are usually not requiring that much optimization. Um, but yeah, when it comes to some bigger projects, uh, then we, we we put stronger focus on on, on performance. Okay. Uh, I see one final question. I'm not sure we'll wait for more questions. Uh, I would ask Oli, do we uh, have more time to gather questions or? Okay, we still, we still have some time. Uh, uh, and yeah, the, the question right now, it may be a, a silly one. Uh, Sumit Mishraut is asking about um, does a programming language has an impact on performance? Uh, of course it has. Yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't mention that, right? Uh, obviously, right? Uh, I, I've been doing some C plus uh, plus, which gives you like more predictable uh, performance because there's no garbage collector involved, so there are no poses uh, like this, like 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 in Java. Um, that's that's one obvious thing. Um, another thing is that you know more like, like C plus plus or C is closer to uh, assembler, so it's it's also more performant because of that. And Java is a bytecode that has to be translated into assembler code. Assembler code. So so yeah. But okay. usually I haven't been focusing on like low level optimization. Okay. 
Great. Like, I, I'm really glad that this is the last question that uh, I get right now, because tomorrow we are going to talk about garbage collectors. We will have a presentation um, by who is talking tomorrow? Przemek Bruski, if I remember correctly. And uh, you will meet Michal Michalczuk again, like the day before. Uh, Paweł, do you have any final words for people who are listening to us right now? Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, if we don't have any more questions, then have a good evening. Yeah, thank you all for, for all the questions, uh, for your patience, for attention. And yeah, see you tomorrow, hopefully. Thank you. Bye. See you.